Hi, my name's Ryan Quick. I'm one of the pastors here at Eaton Baptist Church, and this is part five of six in our Bible Overview series. What we're trying to do in this series is give you six different ways of overviewing the meta-narrative, the big storyline of Scripture. We're doing that as so that we're kind of look, taking our head up out of a map book. We're looking around getting our bearings so that when we go into a text, we understand the finer details. We're zooming out to get our bearings so that when we zoom in, we understand the finer details. What we've looked at so far is understanding the Bible, thinking about it with a timeline, and then with genealogies, remembering the key characters, then with events, remembering the key moments, then with narrative, thinking about how the story starts in paradise, goes to a problem, how that problem's taken through the plot and prophetic to the passion of Christ, how there's ultimate perfection at the end and we're called into participation in the middle. So now, let me introduce to you what we're going to study here this way. Do you remember having pinky promises in primary school? Were you the kind of person that kept every single one of your pinky promises? You still know the deep, dark secret of your primary school friend? Or were you someone who broke pinky promises like that? Do you remember the last pinky promise you made? You probably didn't think about it as the last one you were going to make. Okay, so you might not remember pinky promises. How about contracts? What was the last contract that you signed? Perhaps for you it was signing the contract of a new phone. Or maybe it was a new car. Or maybe it was a house. Or maybe it was a wedding contract. Maybe it was a contract for a new job. But there's this idea of signing on the dotted line, I agree to pay X amount of money, I agree to be in X amount of debt so that I might have that thing, I might work in that way. Well, the Bible overviews itself by talking about six key pinky promises, six key contracts. The Bible language is covenant. It's an agreement over how God will deal with humanity. And there's six key covenants that are highlighted in the biblical story. And by knowing them well, we can overview the whole story. And in each of these covenants, they have eight significant elements. There's the maker of the covenant. There's the mediator of the covenant between him who makes the covenant and the people group with whom it's made. So this comes out of a context of an ancient Near Eastern context where a king would conquer a new nation, a new people group, a new ethnic group, and he would give them a covenant. He would say, I won't destroy all of you. You can become a part of my kingdom. I will treat you this way if you do certain things. And there would be a mediator between that people that is conquered and the king giving these decrees. So there's the maker of the covenant, there's the mediator, then there's the blessings. I will do these things to you on the basis of conditions. Point number four there, you will act these ways. And if you don't act these ways, point number five, there will be consequences. This is what will happen if you don't. Then this is my sign that I will continue to hold the covenant. This is the, the outward symbol that this covenant is true. And then it, within the context of biblical covenants, there's always a metaphor of the covenant community. There's something that helps you understand what that means and what that looks like. And in, in the context of biblical covenants, there's always a promise towards Jesus. So eight uh, key components of the covenants, six key covenants through the Bible story. Let's just go through these covenants and you'll see how it overviews the Bible. The first is a covenant with Adam. Now, just straight away, let me put a footnote here. This one's debated, okay? Some people say, oh, no, 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 the word covenant's not used in Genesis 1 and 2, so there's not a covenant with, with Adam. Hosea chapter 6, verses 7 talks about the covenant between God and Adam. And that one's debated, is, is that just referring to Adam as all of humanity or is Adam from Genesis 1 and 2? We don't know. So I'm just putting a footnote here. This one's debated, but I think it's helpful to have clarity here. So God being the king of all creation, having ordered all things in 10 speeches of the king, all things are created. He promises to bless and deal lovingly. With Adam and Eve and all creation, he will choose to bless them, to be fruitful and multiply. That's the blessings. There's this sense that they are going to work together to do this stuff. So that's 
covenant number one. Covenant number two is with Noah. We can read about that in Genesis chapter six to nine. And God makes a covenant with all of humanity through Noah as the mediator that he won't destroy all things with a flood again, that there will continue to be sunrise, sunset, harvest and planting, sowing, that there will be this continual trustworthiness of the world, that chaos will not come back in and disorder all that God has ordered. And we know the sign of that covenant, don't we? The rainbow. So then the third covenant, Abraham. We can read about that covenant in Genesis 12, in Genesis 15, and Genesis 17. God is making a covenant with Abraham and his family line and through Abraham's family line to all nations that he will bless, make Abraham fruitful and multiply. Does that sound familiar? It's a repeated theme. And through Abraham, bless all the nations of all the world. So Abraham's the mediator of that covenant that God's going to bless all people. The fourth covenant is with Moses. We often refer to this covenant as the Mosaic covenant. We can read about that in Exodus 3, 1 to 10, 6, 7 to 8, and then chapter 19, 5 to 6. This covenant with the people of Israel, once they'd been set free from Egypt, taught and trained how to live free for God, for Yahweh, there's this covenantal relationship that's outlined in Mount Sinai, that God would love and deal with them in a certain way, that they would be fruitful and multiply in the land of Israel if they lived a certain way. And then we have the fifth covenant, the Davidic covenant, the covenant with David. God promised that to David that he would establish a, a king on David's throne forever. It's an eternal kingdom. And through that uh, kingly rule through that throne, all nations would become blessed back into that Abrahamic, even Adamic Eden blessing of being fruitful and multiplying. But as we go through each of those covenants, the thing we notice is the mediator and the people with whom the covenant is made fail to be a faithful partner with God. God wants to partner with humanity and every single time humanity breaks the covenant and so we see the sixth significant covenant in the bible story is a prophetic one one day god will bring the new covenant let me read it to you from jeremiah chapter 31 to 34 the lord says the time is coming when i'll make a new covenant with the people of israel and with the people of judah it will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and left them out of Egypt. That's referring back to the Mosaic covenant. He took them out of Egypt, established a covenant with them to establish the kingdom of Israel. It's going to be a new one, not like that one. He continues, although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. See, what happens as Israel ultimately moves towards exile, they commit idolatry which the prophets refer to as a adultery. God sees himself as a husband who's loved this wife, Israel, and she keeps whoring herself out. It's strong words. It's the words the Bible uses. It gets to the point where God says, well, at least a whore gets paid to go sleep with these other people. But my, my wife, Israel, she does not. It, it, there's a brokenness in the heart of God that these people keep failing to be the faithful covenant partner God wants them to be. And he keeps outlining here the new covenant of what's going to happen. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I'll put my law within them, write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach a neighbor to know the Lord because all will know me. From the least to the greatest, I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongdoings. I, the Lord, have spoken. So throughout this Old Testament history, there fails to be a, a partner worthy of being in covenantal relationship with God. So there's some positives to reading the Bible with these six covenants in mind. They sort of lap onto each other. The first is that promises and contracts make sense. We make promises, we make contracts. Even to today, you might not be doing pinky promises anymore, but you still sign on the dotted line. And it's also historically viable. It comes out of a context. It doesn't just 
you know, it's not something, this idea that's just fallen out of heaven. It came to a context, to a people, in a time, in a place. And, and so this idea of a king having a contract with his people, it makes sense. There's also some negatives to thinking about the Bible this way. One of them would be, it almost makes it sound like God's this robotic lawyer-like God. I will love you because I said I'll love you. <laughs> and it's like, it, it, that's not what we're meaning by this. What we're meaning by this is God's desire is to love and he's committed himself to do that no matter the cost, no matter what people do, no matter how faithless these people are, God will be faithful. So as I talk about overviewing the Bible, thinking about it in the context of covenants, don't take away God's emotionality, his desire, his passion to love humanity. One of the other negatives is that it forces us to read the Bible in a meditation style. We read it and we reread it, understanding how each covenant builds on and works from the previous covenant, how it develops these ideas. You have to keep reading this idea to understand it fully. As we've been talking about in this series over and over again, the Bible is Christocentric. It's all about Jesus. And he declares as he comes into the world that he is fulfilling, he is bringing that new covenant. Have a look, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17. He says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The law and the prophets is language here talking about all that God had, had declared and all that God had promised that he would do through these covenants. Jesus is saying, I'm fulfilling them. I'm being the faithful covenant partner you were meant to be. You failed to be. I'm being in your place. I'm being the mediator we've always needed, the perfect mediator. Unlike Noah, who gets blotto drunk and something dodgy happens in his tent. Unlike Abraham, who sleeps with his slave. Unlike Moses, who kills a guy. Unlike David who kills someone and sleeps with his wife, we need this perfect mediator and Jesus is the perfect covenant partner we've always needed and the perfect mediator we've always needed so that we can be in right relationship with God. See, God's love is sure, is unshakable for us because it's been supremely shown on the cross that God's love is so clear because he sent what was most precious to him to love those who've been faithless. He pursues that unfaithful wife we've been running after other gods. He sends his son to die in our place for our sins, to be in right relationship with us. And this love, this person and work of Jesus will change our hearts. It's going to write the law of God on our hearts and in our actions. So this is the fifth of six Bible overview. And I hope and I pray that it's starting to impact the way you're thinking about the whole Bible story. I hope we'll see you again soon for the final in this series. Thanks for being with us.